Cool. All right. Well, I'll uh, dive into this. So um, again, thanks for coming uh, this afternoon. We'll talk about uh, two main topics of fabrication today. So the first one is roto molding, and then the second is uh, compression molding. And we'll jump into some details on that. Where I figured would be a good place to start is really breaking each process down into four main parts. So first is just going through an overview of what is the process, what type of parts are typically made with it. Um, talking about the design rules for how would you design a part to use that process. Or maybe said another way, if um, you've got a part, what would be a good fit for um, that process? And then finally, the materials that you'd consider looking at it. So we'll start with uh, roto molding. And uh, I should ask, has anybody designed roto molded parts here before? Does anybody know what roto molding is? And it's totally fine if you don't. It's uh, one of the more, not really esoteric, but it's not like injection molding where everybody does it all the time. OK, so here's uh, just uh, four examples of some typical roto molded parts. Um, one of the key attributes of anything roto molded is it's going to be hollow. And we'll see why that is in a second. Uh, so because of that, it's great for like fuel tanks, storage containers, um, in this case, doll heads. So I, I had the chance when we were at iRobot to build about 100,000 of this kind of crazy robotic uh, interactive doll and got to know a lot about you know, uh, building doll heads and doll limbs. And then um, kayaks. Is that on top of your resume? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the other fun thing is like kayaks and outhouses. Um, are also good examples of roto molded parts. So some of the advantages of roto molding and where you might consider this um, manufacturing technology is if you have to build either large or small, but basically hollow, um, hollow parts. And the advantage here is it has no weld lines. So if you think of injection molding, A, you can't build a hollow part easily um, unless you build it in two pieces. But B, any time you have a penetration in an injection molded, your flow is going to come back together and have to knit. In roto molding, that, um, that doesn't happen at all. So it gives you a nice, very strong, stable part. Uh, it's great for large parts. So you could build parts as big as this, um, as big as this room, just giant storage containers or like fuel tanks or, or things like that, where again, for injection molding, you're sort of limited to parts um, in arm's width. Uh, there's no internal stresses due to flow because there's no flow. Uh, so it solves that problem. It's OK to do undercuts. Now, this is more so if you have a flexible part. So if you think of like a doll head, that's got a lot of undercuts for the ears and things like that. And that's well suited. For the bigger parts, your mold might be designed in such a way that it's actually a couple pieces that come apart. And that lets you um, achieve an undercut. And then it's also really good for short and high, um, high production volumes, where again, injection molding is much more of a technique suited for higher, um, higher runs. You can use multiple colors. So one of the examples we'll look at is kayaks. You can see there's some really cool tie-dye like um, going on, whereas injection molding is usually just one color. And uh, the tooling, because it's not a high pressure tool, is often much cheaper and much quicker to build, which is great. So if you did want to prototype something quickly and it fit with roto molding, this is a really nice technique to, um, to use. The other advantage is, unlike injection molding, where you've got the hopper and then the screw feeding the resin in, uh, with this, there's nothing to purge. So you can change colors or materials very quickly. Um, so that's also good for really short, short run production. There's no scrap because there's no runner and sprue. There's really no plumbing. Every piece of material you put into the mold is going to be incorporated into the part. And uh, sometime later, we can talk about blow molding. But one of the advantage of uh, roto molding is that typically the corners or the edges are going to be thicker rather than thinner. And that will give you more strength, um, you know, less thinning, so you'll um, not have light shining through or something like that. And then you can also use both rigid and flexible um, materials. Well, what would be a rigid material? So uh, m about 85% of blow molding is done with polyethylene, so like high density or low density. If you think of like a milk container, that's a, a good example of PE. Uh, and then you can use other polys as well. Whereas a flexible would be like uh, PVC is often used if you think of a, a doll head um, where it's a little bit um, 
a little bit flexible. Uh, so those are all the, uh, and that's a great question. I should also, uh, any questions, please jump in. It's, it's more fun if it's interactive. Um, and if you have experience with molding or want to jump in with comments, that's, that's encouraged as well. Um, so on the downside of rotomolding, molding, the parts have a longer cycle time, um, which means often, say, if you're doing doll heads, which is a high volume thing, you've got to build multiple cavities. And um, the key thing here that's driving it is uh, the cooling factor, that you've got to get the heat out of the, the mold to get the part to solidify. Uh, How do you do multiple cavities in a row mold? Yeah, so what you would do, let's say we're building a doll head, and I've got a cool video in here, is often what the artist would do is shape the industrial model of whatever the final product's going to look like. And then you put that in an electrolytic bath and will grow a copper mold on top of it, do a lost wax to get rid of the model, and basically just repeat that process you know, multiple times. So you'd want to have a way to copy the original model into multiple waxes. And I think the one we see here is a 16 cavity. So it's literally 16 of these pots arranged and you'll you fill them. Is it like in a ring arranged? It's typically in a matrix. Um, yeah, and it's all sort of fitted in one frame that they'll fill with the metered shot and then it goes through the process and comes out. And then the, it's pretty interesting. It's like an alien evolving to, you know, as I pull them out. Uh, but yeah, I've got some cool video we can, we can check out. Um, some things you can imagine, or you, hopefully you'll be able to imagine as we get into the nuts and bolts of how it's done, is if you have a very narrow rib, that may have trouble filling. So you'd want to avoid things like that. Whereas, of course, in injection molding, that's not a big deal. Um, that, that's pretty normal. To some degree, you can't control the wall thickness. It's usually plus or minus 10%. So as I was talking about for the baby that we designed, we had a whole bunch of cams uh, under the skin that were actuating her eyebrows and her eyes and her mouth, mouth corners. And for that, getting very um, precise control over the thickness of the skin was incredibly important. So we actually couldn't do roto molding for that. We had to injection mold it with a cavity core which is a much more expensive, complex process. But for most doll heads that are, say aren't, um, aren't automated, then you don't care too much about the thickness. But all you really can control is the outside geometry. You don't have direct control over the inside. And then um, the material is gonna be slightly more expensive because you have to either grind it up into pellets or really fine powder, and that extra step costs, costs money. Um, the finer you put it, the more it can penetrate the smaller features you might have. Um, so that will drive your cost up a little bit. So let's take a look here at how the actual rotomolding process works. So there's basically four steps. The first is, uh, and in this case I'm going to use a powdered material, but you could also use a liquid. The first is you take a measured or metered amount of material and put it in the mold. And often before that, you'll want to spray it with mold release just to get it to uh, extract quickly. Then once it's in, you shut, you shut the mold and you'll want to shake it in two in a biaxial direction or two different directions to make sure that it all spreads around evenly. And while you're do, doing that, you're also heating it as well. And basically, that's just going to melt the plastic. It's going to stick to the outside of the wall due to centripetal force. Uh, you'll cool it, so then it will solidify. Sorry, sorry Scott. What are you yeah. heating it with? Uh, so that um, varies. In some cases, you can use um, just conductive heat. Um, other times, there's fans with convection um, he heating up the mold. The molds are often made out of aluminum, so they have a really good thermal uh, transfer. And you just have to get it above the melting temperature of the, of the resin for it to, to, um, to, to fill the void. So the whole mold is above? Oh, the whole thing, yeah. You're heating the whole kit and caboodle. Yep. And then the final step is just taking it out of the mold. Uh, so I've got a video here, um, which you can see animated. But basically, you add the plastic um, to the mold, shut the mold, heat it up. Uh, then you'll spin it around, and it will coat evenly. And then you'll take the mold apart uh, after you cool it, and it will get extracted. And you can see due to the nature of it, it has to be a hollow part. Um, that's, all, that's all you can do. So here's uh, just a few examples of a couple um, blow molding, or, um, sorry, rotor molding machines. And you can see just due to the size of it, some of these things can be enormous. Um, but again, it's no very low pressure. You will have vents in it because as you heat the air, it needs somewhere to go. 
but compared to injection molding that might be running at 12,000 psi, you know, this is just um, uh, this is much lower than that. So let's watch it in um, actually in process here. And uh, what we're going to build here is a kayak. So this is a bunch of um, ground up, um, probably with some form of polyethylene, uh, being placed in the mold. And you'll see they'll do a few different colors in there to get the cool tie-dye effect. These are mostly done manually, right? Yes, it's incredibly manual. And that also drives up the cost, um, whereas injection molding can be done much, you know, is much more automated with the robot arms doing extraction. Yeah, and this is a case, obviously, of a much bigger, um, much bigger one. And after this, I'll show you some doll heads being made, um, just as a smaller, smaller version. But basically, here it's going into the heated oven. It's uh, rotating around. And I think they'll shut the, the door of the oven in a second, just to make it more efficient. Spinning, spinning, plastic melts. And you can see here it also it has that bi, um, biaxial rotation. So one is along the long axis and then the other one is rocking up and down. Cycle time for something that's like hours, isn't it? Yeah, this one is probably about 35 to 40 minutes. So that is a problem, or that's why you need the multiple cavities if you're, if you're building in high volume. It's probably pretty well suited for kayaks in that they're you know, not super high volume. But anything um, like the consumer electronic products we typically do, you, you would need the multiple cavities. And then this is the third phase, cooling. They just air cool it? I believe they have on this one some fans that are blowing on it. Um, just to get the cycle time faster. You want to be careful, though, not to go too quick. You want the plastic to come down quickly. Otherwise, you can get some brittle. Um, if, it, if it cools too quickly, um, it could crystallize or cause some problems. Um, so that's one of the limitations, is you can't go too fast or too, and obviously don't want to go too slow or cost more money. In this case, are those molds uh, CNC machined out of aluminum? That's a great question. I think these may have been grown in sections and then put together. But you can build them, you can CNC them, um, you can grow them, you can make them out of sheet metal. Um, there's a whole variety of different ways you could build your tools. Yeah, and the great thing is they're relatively low pressure, um, so you have a lot more freedom. And then here comes out the, uh, the finished kayak. So pretty, pretty cool process. Uh, this next one I like a lot. So it's, this is near and dear to my heart, and I've seen uh, hundreds if not thousands of these. So this is how babies are made, in case you ever wondered. Um, so here we're filling in the metered shots. You can see there's multiple cavities. This is likely a PVC um, uh, resin. And basically, they're going to put it in the furnace. This is a visualization of, again, spinning around on the two axes to spread the material evenly. And then the best part is the extraction. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, so there you can see like undercuts, no problem. There, I have to just pop right out. So, <laughs> yeah, totally messed up. Um, and that probably has a cycle time for the whole thing of about a minute. So it, it's much, uh, much quicker. What they end up doing there is sticking it in a bath of water. Um, and that does cool it, but it, it's not fast enough that it hurts the material. And of course, you can build arms and legs and heads and the whole, the whole nine yards. You mentioned consumer electronics. What, what would be a good example of a consumer electronic that uses this process? Yeah, so certainly anything in the toy area, like um, smart baby dolls or things like that. It's one of the processes where typically if you can get it from injection molding, um, you wouldn't need to go down the road of molding path. But where I've typically seen it is complex features with a lot of undercuts that, um, that involve some sort of a flexible member. Um, so yeah, it's more, uh, it's not a primary, I wouldn't say it's a primary manufacturing technique, although it's very widespread, but something, if you can't achieve it with injection molding, it's, it's a go-to. Um, so now that you're um, sort of thinking about designing your parts, so again, um, emphasizing hollow uh, with a uniform wall thickness, 
There are some techniques uh, where as the part spins, you can have it end in the same resting position and that will thicken it up a little bit on that side. It's called stop roto molding. But in general, it, um, you should plan on hollowing uniform. Um, you can include in, uh, inserts, so if you wanted to put like a threaded insert to be able to put um, a threaded fastener in later, that's fine. And again, if the material is flexible or your mold can come apart, then uh, undercuts are acceptable. Uh, one of the cool things you can do is if you're not sure what wall thickness you need, you can keep adding more and more material to get the right thickness. So if you do something and it's not quite strong enough, then you can add in more material. Um, and it's a great way to experiment, whereas injection molding, there's no way you can do that. And uh, you know, typically what we'll see for wall thicknesses is a little under um, a millimeter all the way up to about an inch or 25 millimeters. So there's pretty, pretty good variation. As we talked about in the beginning, in general you want to avoid nooks and crannies just because as you think about it spinning, the, um, the ground powder is just not going to get in there as effectively. Um, we talked about the stop molding where you can, with a certain device, have a program to stop in a, a particular angular, angular offset and thicken up that wall. And then in terms of the materials, as I talked about in the very beginning, about 85% of it's polyethylene, either high density or low density. Uh, baby heads tend to be PVC. Uh, if you, you can use ABS, nylon, those are usually about 1% of the um, rotomolded parts. Um, so you want to typically be thinking about um, polyethylene. Do they use other stuff like two-part, like silicones and RQVs and stuff like that? I haven't seen that done. It's usually um, some form of a, a poly um, as opposed to a thermoset. Uh, but that's a great lead-in for the next one, which is compression molding, so, um, which I'll jump into. Any, any questions before we get into compression molding on roto molding? Cool. Well, you, you were going to talk about the pros and cons of roto molding versus uh, blow molding. Oh, yeah, so the pros and cons, um, roto molding is, uh, you can do much, much bigger parts. So you wouldn't blow mold uh, an outhouse, for example. Like, uh, just because that would be a, an enormous uh, tool and blow mold is pressurized. Um, the roto molding has the advantages of thickening the corners where blow molding would thin them. Uh, you do have a greater choice of materials for roto molding and also a color variation um, than you would for blow molding. And as, as we touched on, like a bigger, um, so blow molding is a process of basically dropping a tube. Uh, and then um, clamshelling it, sticking in a needle and inflating it, and it will take the size. So like a, a milk carton is a great example of a blow molded part. And with that, um, the cycle time is much shorter, so you can achieve higher volume. Um, whereas the wall thickness on that would be too thin. Well, it's probably borderline for roto molding, but the cycle time would be way too long. So, and we tend to see a few more blow molded parts than roto molded. Um, but they are also, it also by definition is hollow. Um, that both, that would be the same for both processes. So like, a, like the five gallon gas can is blow molded, not road molded. The five, ga that one could go either way. I would in general think the five gallon gas can would tend to be roto molded. Um, but it, it might depend on the process. Um, so yeah, you can, usually you can tell by, by looking at them. Um, the, just the way the wall thicknesses are and the corners and things like that to tell which way it goes. I um, use uh, blow molding a lot for if you have a feature that's injection molded, like a Coke can. Yes, so if you wanted to make like a Coke bottle, that's actually a great, um, so that one's really cool. You basically injection mold what looks like a test tube with the threaded features in it, and then you blow mold the, the bottom to get that super thin wall thickness, which you just couldn't get through conventional injection molding. And of course, it's hollow um, with a massive undercut on the inside. So yeah, the way uh, soda models are made is just absolutely fascinating. And then often, um, they have multiple layers uh, within that just to uh, prevent the gas from coming out. Yeah, there's an insane amount of technology in, in those. It's crazy. Awesome. Well, thank you.